Piracy has been around for centuries, and today it remains a worldwide problem. There are several piracy hotspots throughout the world, such as the Indian Ocean, East Africa and the Far East, including the South China Sea, South America and the Caribbean. Modern pirates are still involved in looting and hijacking ships for ransom. So how do we deal with this threat? Where does piracy end and terrorism begin? Is there an impact on global trade? Do operations by NATO or the EU help in combating piracy? Today, Dr. Fotios Moustakis, Associate Professor of Strategic Studies and Director of Dartmouth Centre for Sea Power and Strategy at the University of Plymouth, and Dr. Stavros Garamberidis, Lecturer in Maritime Economics and Program Manager of the MSc in International Logistics and Shipping Programs, also at the University of Plymouth, are here to answer exactly those questions. Good day to both of you. Hi, Evan. So, first things first, why does piracy take place in some regions and not in others? Yes, um, if I may start, uh, as we have seen, of course, with the incidents in, um, in uh, Somalia, um, the, the same kind of conditions that they, they exist in Somalia, they exist right currently in the Gulf of Guinea, which has become the world's piracy hotspot as a result. Of course, the region accounts for approximately 90% of crew taken hostage and crew kidnappings globally in the first quarter of 2020. Okay. Uh, just to add on all those which Fotis has just said, uh, we have to think that pirates are looking for cargo, precious cargo, and the value of the ship, of course. And when pirates are attacking a vessel, are actually are attacking, uh, they're thinking like money. So uh, we have to think that when you're a pirate, we have to get in their minds and we think that the, they're seeing a vessel and the cargo as dollars because that's the equivalent of, uh, you know, the, the money that we're using in shipping. Mm -hmm. So when we see a lot of shipping and, and piracy attacks, uh, that means that there's a lot of trade that is happening in a specific region. And because there are so many vessels, like for instance, in the West Africa at the moment, there is a lot of pangers that are going over there in order to load and unload, uh, actually to load, sorry, um, uh, oil from the region. That's why pirates are getting on board in order to get the vessels and ask for ransoms. So do they, um, do they know what vessel is carrying what beforehand or not? I mean, do they target specific vessels? They target specific vessels because of the characteristics. So, for instance, it's easier for them to attack a tanker vessel when it's loaded because the freeboard is lower than uh, a container vessel, for example, because the freeboard is higher. So it's more difficult for them to get on board. So by definition, by easiness, let's say, of, of attacking the vessel, they're trying to filter the vessels that they can easier attack. So dry bulks, tankers are easier targets because the freeboard is lower and it's easier for them with the ladders that they're using to get on board to attack the vessel. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that, you know, sometimes some of the more sophisticated gangs, uh, they're also looking for the cargo that's carrying on board. So for instance, we've seen attacks on container vessels because they knew they were carrying very, very precious cargo on board. And regardless of the fact it was very difficult physically to attack the vessel because, as I said, the freeboard was really high, they still attack it because they knew it was very high valuable cargo. Don't forget the movie Captain Phillips, it was a container vessel. <laughs> it is also, so, Eleni, important to mention, of course, the lack of naval presence. Because when you don't have naval presence, which is what's happening pretty much in the in, in, uh, Gulf of Guinea, there is a high motive, or there is also a motive of high financial reward. Mm -hmm. And of course, a comparative low kind of risk of detection or capture. These also factors, in, in addition with a kind of favorable, I would say, um, geography and location of where the, the attacks take place, especially with, uh, as you know, as I've mentioned, we do have slow moving vessels in, in, in high traffic areas and the congestions that we tend to see uh, at Lagos ports as a result also of the pandemic, that has also played an important role and has significant kind of impact on the cases of piracy mm -hmm. in, in the Gulf of Guinea. Okay, so I mean, you would say that uh, political instability, of course, plays a role um, in, in piracy itself. But the, the question is, where does terrorism begin and piracy end or the other way around? Where do we draw the line in that? 
Well, as we uh, first of all, you, you, you are right to say that you know that the truth is when we're talking about piracy, like we have seen, for example, you know, in the case of in in Somalia, piracy is a symptom of the breakdown of the country's political system. It it is it happens as a result of the lack of proper legislation, of or I would say of weak governance, of uh, social economic kind of issues like unemployment or issues maybe also environmental issues. And of course, a number of ethnic conflicts takes place. And this is what we have seen taking place, of course, unfortunately, in Nigeria. So terrorism, as we said, it's, on, it's about political objectives. Uh, and in this case, we have to, also to make clear that you know, when the motives behind kind of uh, terrorist attacks, yes, it might be, of course, financial, but ultimately it is to advance the political goals of this organization. What we see in, 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 in Somalia, so you saw in Somalia, and what we see now in, in the Gulf of Guinea, it's, it's about money. It's mainly it's a financial kind of incentive and motive which makes people actually turn to this kind of activities. And that is what I think we should you know, clarify when we talk about it. I'm not saying that religious conflict and other issues, and ethnic conflict has not played a role had an impact in, in the situation, the Gulf of Guinea and Nigeria. But the cases that we're witnessing at the moment in that region are basically have to do with financial kind of motives and rewards. Yeah. So correct me if what is if I'm wrong on that, but for me, uh, especially the area that you're describing at the moment, this uh, piracy and vessels being attacked is the low hanging fruit of how you can get money. Yes. Because People, they have already arms because of the conflicts that they're having in the region for many, many years. So they have easy access to arms. That's not a problem. And they can take a small power boat, which is costing, uh, it's a very small investment for them. And they can easily use those arms against the vessels, which don't forget that some of those vessels, you know, the average cost of a vessel is 15 million US dollars, mm -hmm. but only the, the, the asset itself plus the cargo that's carrying, and especially if we're talking about oil that could go up to 25 million in total. And of course, if you have some, you know, if you have a small gang of people with some arms that they're looking on something that looks like 25 million, uh, you can easily understand why they're doing it. Exactly. I mean, people tend to piracy when economic opportunities are elsewhere are scarce. And I think it is a, it is a lucrative profession. And of course, as we have seen, the states and, and companies uh, will pay the ransom set by pirates, to be honest, because this is actually very important to them. But as you, as, 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 as Stavros mentioned, uh, it is important to understand that all this has to do with the fact that, you know, all this kind of activities is a result of the political kind of instability and weak government that exists uh, on land. That is the, the reason yeah. behind this kind of attacks. Mm -hmm. Because so, shipping, is, shipping is trading, and sorry for interrupting last note, shipping is trading all over the globe. You know, everywhere we have ports, but we see it only in specific regions. So for instance, we haven't seen any pirate attacks in Europe. Why is that? Because we have stable governments, you know, we have port authorities, we have uh, port police taking place of everything. And you know, you have proper governments that are having the naval forces escorting their waters. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the question is, where do you really uh, begin to negotiate a mandate to address this type of threat? Do you? Mandate? Mm -hmm. um, th there are ways you can deal with this. I mean, in initially, you try to, to uh, establish some kind of regional collaboration with the, the, the countries. And at the moment, of course, that's problematic. Uh, we had similar kind of situation, of course, in, in Southeast Asia, but in the last, you know, I would say 10, 15 years, there's been a very strong collaboration since 2004, I would say 15 years now. There has been a kind of a joint rapid response, I would say, by countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, and the attempt to, to address the, you know, the, the, the incidents of the piracy in their region. Something, something like this might start, have to be actually a priority, in the region, the Gulf of, of Guinea, we start with a regional kind of collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, some kind of you know rapid response teams, which can be uh, worked together or uh, within all the states that have been affected by this, led by Nigeria, of course, in this case. Uh, even some kind of a regional counter piracy agreement can be kind of one of the first step to deal with this kind of uh, situation. And then you move on probably to another kind of, uh, I would say, um, initiatives like a kind of multinational response. 
let's not forget there is a big difference between what we have the, the virus incidents in Somalia and what we have here. Most of the kind of attacks that are taking place in the Gulf of Guinea are within the territorial seawaters of, of Nigeria. Well, for example, Somalia is also an international kind of water, so it was mm -hmm. easier for the international community to launch kind of operation and a naval effort uh, to assist, you know, the, the civic industry. Uh, but that is not the case at the moment, of course, in, um, in, in the West Africa. I'm so you, you, go on. Am I interrupting someone? No. Um, I mean, no. You mentioned multinational operations there um, and also um, some sort of counter piracy, uh, regional counter piracy mandate. Um, is that likely though? I mean, if we take, if we take into account the corruption that exists in some of these states. Um, is that a likely scenario? Um, in, in my opinion, it is a likely scenario. Let's not forget that the last couple of years we have a specific kind of a multi, multinational, multinational exercise, which is sponsored by the US Africa Command, they called the Urban Game Express. Of course, this year was canceled as a result of the pandemic, COVID-19. But this kind of uh, exercise, which involved more than 30 nations uh, in the last year, um, is designed to strengthen this kind of maritime co uh, co cooperation between states and maritime security, but also to provide awareness in maritime domain, and at the same time, so helps the nations, of course, to uh, share information in order, to, of course, to address this kind of threats that they are facing in the Gulf of Guinea. So we have seen a kind of initiative like uh, which was sponsored by their you know the, the americans and and that is kind of an example of how you can probably engage the international co community um furthermore i mean if 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 there is a kind of uh, i would say desire by the affected states they i guess they can also ask advice from uh, nato nato has significant kind of experience dealing with this kind of issues with the European Union. Uh, don't, let's not forget the three international naval efforts uh, that took place, of course, in, in Somalia, from Operation Talada, Operation Ocean Shield, and combined uh, Task Force 151. So it all depends of the regional actors, how the regional actors would like to actually address this issue. And I believe if they do ask for assistance, the international community will be willing to provide it. Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's the key there. Um, will will they do they ask for assistance? How often do they ask for assistance? Um, and um, then I suppose yes, international community does does uh, go ahead and and give that assistance. Um, the question is, how how often do these multinational operations take place? You mentioned NATO. How often does NATO have operations that assist in in combating the threat of piracy? Well, the, the operation that we have seen in uh, in Africa, it was pretty much as it's an annual uh, exercise, and, and as I said, it involves a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. We do know, of course, uh, many countries in Africa, especially in affected areas, do not lack the naval capability, but they can contribute, you know, with any kind of ways and or, or, or kind of uh, uh, methods they can. Uh, so there are kind of uh, operations, I would say, exercises like the one that I mentioned which can be quite useful to learn, to take learn lessons. And then of course, after that, uh, try to um, in, you know, use this kind of lessons for dealing with this kind of threats. But ultimately, I think what is important here to mention is the participation of the affected countries and the closer collaboration of these countries, like the ones we have seen, of course, Southeast Asia and the South China Sea, that we, they, we do need to bring to the attention of these countries you know, the kind of the problem and encourage them to work together uh, and trying to find some kind of way of modus operandi where they can actually address this kind of threats uh, together as a collective. Uh, that, of course, is something that needs to be, of course, addressed by the countries themselves. But as I said, the international community can provide the expertise, the know-how, the knowledge from previous kind of cases. Uh, and I'm sure that they would be in a position, of course, to assist them if, uh, you know, uh, it is required, if, if this kind of assistance is uh, pretty much uh, put forward by the government in, in East Africa, sorry, West Africa. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how many incidents are there, um, let's say, on a monthly basis? I would assume um, that the peak is in the in this period that we're in now in the summer or, or not? What were the latest incidents? Um, stop. Hey, um, good I question. Think, I'm just looking at the numbers. <laughs> I, I think the last, the first quarter of the 2020, we had uh, uh, 21 attacks uh, took place in the Gulf of Guinea out of approximately 50, mm -hmm. I think, uh, attacks. Um, so, which is, you know, it is quite a significant number because you can see that most of the incidents take place, of course, in, in that uh, region. Um, and we also, of course, we had recently, only uh, last week, we had, of course, a, a significant kind of um, uh, another incident, of course, in the Gulf of Guinea, where 13 out of 19, I think, crew members uh, of a Greek tanker were actually kidnapped uh, in, in the Gulf of Guinea. So it is very active. At the moment, as we as we mentioned, you know, it has become the world's piracy hotspot, yeah. um, and uh, it will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. That's true. So nothing changes there. It seems uh, that piracy still remains hot there, despite the fact that the Gulf of Mexico has um, had an increase um, in piracy in the past few years. Gulf of Mexico, I wouldn't say that, uh, but I would say that at least the last couple of years we're seeing a kind of small downward trend, and that's because of um, you know the operations that Fortis was describing earlier on. You know that we have some kind of collaborations taking place uh, with various governments in regional level. The issue is that you know you, it's 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 like a fire. You try to put it down in one in one, one place, like it happened in Somalia, for example, that we had the operation sealed from, from NATO. We had the operations there. And, you know, from, uh, if, if I remember correctly, we had like 500 incidents per year back in 2011. Sorry, I'm not having the stats in front of me, but I think that was the case. Um, and now we have close to zero mm -hmm. because of the very good job that's been done from NATO. The problem is this, the turn of the, the fire in that place. And as Ford is discussing, the last couple of years, we see a huge increase in Nigeria. And as we discussed earlier on, that kind of spike has become because, as we said, easy access to firearms, you know, easy, they see that, you know, it's costing money and they can get money out of the operation that they're having. Uh, of course, we don't have to forget that, you know, when we're talking about the cost of piracy, we have to think about various factors. So, for instance, uh, some of the factors that are linked with um, cost of piracy is ransoms. You know, it's like you can get on board and get all that kind of stuff. Of course, uh, having all the kind of naval forces operating in the region, it's costing money as well. Also, prosecuting the pirates, because as long as you capture the pirates, depends on where you're capturing them. Okay, if they're... In, if they're being captured in international waters is a different story, but if you capture them in national waters, you have to think that they have to be prosecuted in the country that have been captured. Then you have to think about uh, the organizations that they're kind of uh, involved in the overall reducing the piracy. Then you have to think about the insurance premiums because uh, it's like your car, you know, uh, when you operate a vessel, uh, if you have a lot of claims or a lot of incidents taking place uh, into you, then the insurance premiums are going higher. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you have to think that, you know, it's like when you, you know that you're in pirate region, um, going back to the analogy of Jack Sparrow and, you know, the Caribbean pirates and all that kind of stuff, a lot of the sailing companies or the vessels, they wanted to avoid that kind of waters because they knew that there were pirates in there. So they were trying to diversify their vessels. So they were trying to reroute the vessels to avoid the piracy zones. And of course, um, in some cases, you may have some security equipment on board, which is also helping you to avoid and pirates getting on board. So all that kind of things are some things that ship owners have to think, and also the international community have to think, because don't forget that the vessel by itself is a, is a floating island, let's call it, that has 30, 40 people on board, uh, and they're living in a very expensive island that a lot of people want to get on board and get it. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are very interesting numbers. Um, so. Yes, there is an impact on shipping, um, but what exactly is the impact of global trade? Um, Just to give you a number, back in 2019, we have 162 vessels that had been attacked. They had a piracy attack, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? Uh, of course, out of the thousands of hundreds of vessels being uh, traded all over the place, it seems like a small number, 
but you have to multiply that with 30 people that are living on board in each vessel and you can understand how many people have been uh, under in very difficult situations you know you, you usually you have a, a seafarer that's coming from philippines or indonesia who has uh, only some basic seafarers training and suddenly he's coming uh, he's facing a guy with a uh, a gun who is shooting him or you know he's pointing on him and uh, you know and you're being kidnapped and you don't have you don't have a police to call because you're in the middle of the sea nobody's going to come and rescue you or it's not an easy operation to come and rescue you because you're in either international waters or far away from from the land so it's difficult for uh, authorities to come and assist you and uh, of course some of those guys especially in the west africa area they've been in war for many many years so they're very rough people they don't they don't seem to care about the human life so they can easily kill someone that is going against them um, so it's a very difficult mix that uh, shipping sector has to deal with and it's a very um, something is happening here anyhow and it's a very difficult mix that it has to be dealt uh, from the shipping sector because as i said is uh, very difficult it's very multidimensional and it can change from country to country because as Fotio said earlier on, different countries have different naval forces, different rules and all that kind of stuff. The, the global trade is quite important actually, as you mentioned, Eleni. what is the, the impact of global trade? Uh, the region is quite important, you know, it is one of the world's most important shipping, I would say, routes for both oil exports and, and consumer goods from, you know, from Central and West Africa. Um, but also the region, I mean, before coronavirus, of course, that produces approximately 5 million barrels of uh, crude petroleum per day, which was, of course, a vital kind of source of oil and gas for, you know, Asia and Europe, to be honest. And Nigeria, of course, is the largest, as probably uh, many people are already aware, is the largest oil producer in the region. So it's got, it has a kind of significant impact on, on global trade. Mm -hmm. Where do you see this going in the future? How do you see piracy unfolding? Is it going to, I mean, it's one of those things that's been around for thousands of years. So I'm assuming, mm -hmm. and I suppose everybody else is, that it will stay around for, yeah. for, you know, for another thousand years or I, forever. But where... I, I think... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry, I, th I, think, I think it's going to change nature. So nowadays we have the physical piracy. We have the typical pirates as Jack Sparrow or as those who have seen the films with uh, Captain Phillips getting on board, having a yeah. gun. I'm sure they don't look like that. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to look like that. I think nowadays, especially with a lot of automation that's going to take place in, in ships, uh, because nowadays modern shipping is trying to optimize the operation. So they put a lot of technology on board. We have a lot of... Um, computers on board and a lot of things are happening remotely i think more and more we're going to have that happening and of course in areas that a lot of pirates are operating i can see in the near not in the near future of course but in the next 20 years let's say i can see that a fully automated vessel can get in there uh, from someone who is remotely operating it from london or from piraeus or from wherever hamburg uh, is operating the vessel and can get in that kind of tricky areas, get the cargo and get out without any, any problem because anybody who could get on board, he is not going to be able to do anything to the vessel. Everything is going to be automated, remotely uh, controlled. Of course, that mm -hmm. brings another element to the discussion because as you said, piracy is not going to uh, disappear anytime soon. We have the cyber piracy nowadays. So nowadays we have a lot of pirates that are getting digitally and because of no, the, all the new technologies that we're influencing into the vessels, or we're infusing in the vessels in order to improve the operations. Hackers are getting on board. Uh, they can get control of the vessel and they can ask ransoms again. So you don't really need to get a gun anymore in order to get even on board. You can do it from any place of the world. You can be in Venezuela and hack a vessel this trading in China and vice versa. You know, it's like, and that's what is happening with cybersecurity, for example, nowadays. And that's going to be the future. We have to really pay attention to that. And, and, and of course, we, let's not forget that, as we mentioned at the beginning of this interview, that piracy is a result of a kind of a political kind of situation. It's, a, it's as a result of the country's political system. If the political climate is favorable, 
then of course you will pretty much grow the kind of the conditions for the rise of piracy. It's a combination, a factor, a number of factors combined together, which will allow, of course, the you know this kind of piracy incident. And of course, in this case, we need to take you know first, of course, I mentioned the political situation. You need also to we need to mention the lack of presence, naval presence from the states have been affected, of course, and also the geography, the geography, the maritime geography uh, is important and give us kind of a good indication, will give us a good indication of when piracy will take place. So I think at least we, we know pretty much, I think we have a better good idea of uh, the kind of the conditions that they need to be to exist in order to, you know, to, to see the kind of the, the piracy uh, uh, incidents in the future. But as Stavros mentioned, the new dimension, it would be, of course, uh, the cyber, maritime cyber kind of attacks, which is pretty much um, is going to be many in a couple of years time, maybe the norm, especially as a result of this kind of automation of the vessels. Uh, and of course, the other things are taking place as, 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 as we speak with regard to the technology of the ships, even the design of the ship or the edge kind of ships, of course, that they will change as a result of these kind of measures that then that ship owners and companies have to take. So, yes, but ultimately, let's not forget, when we have a piracy kind of hotspot, is the result of specific conditions, and political conditions are paramount to this. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think piracy doesn't have any difference from any kind of a normal theft. The only extra dimensions and layers that we have is that, as Fortius has mentioned, is that you have to think about social political factors that are a bit stronger. You know, when you have normal theft in your country it's the same country well when we're talking about shipping is international so you have to get more dimensions into that and as theft is changing in the modern years you know you have more new technological thoughts like the spams and all that kind of stuff that is getting and people are calling you and they're getting your bank details and all that kind of stuff uh, the same kind of piracy i think is going to evolve it's, we're not going to have the jack sparrow style of pirate attacks we're going to change the pirate attacks to more sophisticated attacks to vessels at the end of the day i think we can avoid that and you know also the insurance companies do that that they have to insure vessels against that kind of risk because at the end of the day everything is a risk and that kind of risk has to be calculated and find a number against it so we should be able to predict that kind of risk and uh, and how much it's going to cost us but i think in the, in the near future we're going to see changes on the way that pirates have been operating the last uh, hundreds of years let's say uh, on how the, the how they're going to do their future pirate attacks. Mm -hmm. um, finally, just one last question. Um, the coronavirus has been, uh, you mentioned the coronavirus th throughout the uh, discussion that we've just had, and of course it's still around and it's still affecting our lives. How has it affected piracy? I think it has caused a lot of delays in a number of ports, to be honest, and that is probably something that we have seen as a result of the coronavirus. Um, and of course, uh, you know, um, economic hardship, you know, uh, widespread economic hardship, which will cause, would be caused as a result of, of this uh, coronavirus. Uh, and it's easy access to weapons, as I said, and with, you know, weak governments in, in place, these kind of conditions, I would say, can probably might increase the number of, of piracy attacks uh, in, in hotspot areas, like, of course, the Gulf of Guinea. Um, but uh, initially, what we see is a significant delay, right, in the kind of ports because, of course, of the cargo, because the uh, crew cannot have been actually um, leave and replaced, uh, and of course, um, um, the trade has pretty much been affected seriously by this, of course, as a result, of course, of the kind of pandemic that has uh, hit pretty much the whole globe. So. Um, yeah, I, I think from what I'm hearing, if you try to, let's say, make a correlation, if we can, if we can draw a line between what piracy is, how piracy is evolving in COVID-19, because as Fortius mentioned earlier on, we're having a huge crisis about the crew changes at the moment. You know, people who are working in the shipping sector, imagine that you're traveling for many weeks away from your family and when, you know, you have to take your annual leave, nowadays it's impossible because you departed from let's say Africa and in 10 days you're landing in Brazil and in theory you, you, you should have your chains there, someone else is going to replace you and you get off port the vessel and go back to your family. But nowadays because of the pandemic, you know, people are not accepting you because they think you just came from another country, you know, all the kind of crazy protocols and all the kind of stuff. So we have people that have been stuck for many, many months on board 
and the problem is that's bringing them a lot of tiredness. And don't forget, number one thing that we have to have in order to tackle piracy is preparedness. And you can imagine that you're having a crew nowadays that's very tired of being on board for many, many months, and they're not anymore alerted. You know, they're going to that kind of zones of piracy, and they're not alerted anymore because they're so tired. So what I'm expecting to see, if we're not going to have any change on the crew, and thankfully, a lot, especially in the UK, the UK government and a lot of other governments are screaming to, to open the borders for that kind of seafarers that are actually facilitating global trade and globalization, because without them, we wouldn't have vessels navigating from point A to point B, from one port to another, and that wouldn't stop globalization. Um, if we don't have that kind of crew change anytime soon, then probably we're going to see have more accidents, not only on piracy, but in other um, areas as well. Because, you know, crew is getting tired of being on the sea for such a long period of time. And, and pirates know that. That's why the kind of model that they use is about, is focusing on a kidnapping crew, to kidnapping crew members and demand a ransom. So take into consideration all these factors that Stavros mentioned. It is, of course, natural that the companies will try to come up with a quick resolution to this and try to address pretty much the demands of the pirates. So this kind of model, I believe, as a result, but it will continue. And I will not be surprised if we start you know, seeing, but we might have to even seen as we speak, actually, there might be some incidents, where pirates might try to, of course, to operate more than kind of 150 miles from, you know, from shore. Uh, so we, they will try to increase the kind of, you know, radius and the tax on, on, on vessels by, by trying to take advantage of the current situation you know, as a result of the coronavirus, you know, pandemic. Thank you both for your insight in this extremely interesting discussion. Um, and uh, hope uh, we have another discussion soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.